It's often said that real locations are not only the best ways to get authentic performances out of actors, but to create a distinct atmosphere for your film. But what if you were to shoot a film entirely on a soundstage in London that was actually meant to take place in a monastery within a mountain range in India? Could you still achieve an effective atmosphere and perhaps even benefit from the faux nature of your location? This is exactly what duo filmmakers Michael Powell and Emmerich Pressburger accomplished in 1947 with their haunting film Black Narcissus. In the midst of what was easily their most artistically fertile period, after such successes as The Life and Death of Colonel Blimp, I Know Where I'm Going, and A Matter of Life and Death, the team formerly known as The Archers set out to make an atmospherically rich and heightened drama about a convent of British nuns setting up a new nunnery in India there to educate and help the local population. But what began with good intentions quickly becomes a nightmare for the godly women. It's not so much a string of events that causes this downward spiral for the nunnery, but the mystical, haunting atmosphere of this strange place that is created by Powell and Pressburger. The film relies heavily on this atmosphere and builds it in a few different ways using the tools that are at a filmmaker's dispensary. One of those vital tools is the way in which the location is utilized. Not a single frame of the film was shot in India, despite everything but the opening scene taking place there. It was indeed all shot on sound stages at Pinewood Studios in London, England. But what would normally, especially nowadays, be seen as a detriment works wonders for the film. Powell and Pressburger, either intentionally or unintentionally, take cues from the German Expressionist movement of the 1920s which were known for using highly stylized and exaggerated sets to manifest the internal world of the characters through the external world around them. The archers do something similar here, whereby merging the sets with beautiful matte paintings creates a tone in the viewer's mind that is unsettling, but not in an overbearing or obvious way. It just slips into your subconscious seamlessly. They don't go full on Dr. Caligari with the sets, but toe the line between seeming real but feeling off, but never quite being able to put your finger on why, which creates a sense of dread and builds tension in the viewer. They're carefully purposed into the many shots, and because the sets are all fake, they can manipulate the elements in ways that wouldn't have been possible had they really gone to India as was initially intended. Could they have gotten the wind machine to blow just right for such a natural, open environment? Maybe, but probably not, and even if it had, it probably would have taken a great many takes and not even have turned out exactly how the filmmakers wanted. This way, however, the filmmakers could manipulate the wind exactly how they wished. As Michael Powell said about the film, The atmosphere in this film is everything, and we must create and control it from the start. Wind, the altitude, the beauty of the setting, it must all be under our control. The other vital element of the film that creates its distinct atmosphere is the use of color. Color cinematography was still a novelty in the 1940s, and the few films that were being made in color tended to lack something. They were too sterile, too preordained, which makes sense when you find out that Technicolor had some of their employees supervising the sets of films that used their color processing format to make sure that the look of all of them aligned to a uniform Technicolor style. But Michael Powell was always a maverick when it came to utilizing Technicolor, and the aid provided by his usual cinematographer, Jack Cardiff, was just the help he needed in combating the pressures from the studios and Technicolor themselves to conform to that preordained look. We can see Cardiff's indifference to the rules of how to shoot with Technicolor in the entire film, but some shots exemplify this more than others, such as the one in which Sister Ruth runs through the halls and rooms of the monastery. The harsh sunlight hits the tiled floor and creates a strong glare in the lens. This was thought to be a mistake by a color processing team, so you can imagine Cardiff's frustrations when he stated that he was actually trying his hardest to get the light to be that glaring. And this is just one example of the unconventional ways in which the archers and their camera crew use the tool of color in film. Similar to the sets, their use of color do not attempt to capture reality in any way. In much the same way the Germans utilized black and white photography during the silent era, the archers do the same with color, expressionistic, bold, and representative of the characters' internal states and themes of the film. The austere white of the nuns' uniforms contrasting with the vibrant beauty of the world around them, a world of pleasures that they are so adamant against enjoying or appreciating. The contrast later in the film between those same austere white uniforms 
and the red dress that Sister Ruth wears when she gives up the mission and sheds her uniform. That, combined with the very sensual shot of her putting on her red lipstick, serves to showcase the transition of her character. The compositions do serve to demonstrate this, but they wouldn't be nearly as powerful if done in black and white. It's the contrast and vibrancy of the colors that make such a strong impression on the viewer in these vital moments of the film, and are what give the film its rich atmosphere. Whether it's black and white, or color, or hell even tinted, they all serve their purpose just like any other tool in the filmmaker's toolkit. The filmmaker just needs to know how to best utilize the tools they're given, and Michael Powell and Emmerich Pressburger were masters of cinema precisely because of their skill at knowing not only how to employ the tools they were given, but more importantly, how to break the established rules for how it should be done.